Okay, so let's get started with this. Uh, I will first introduce myself very quickly. So I'm actually working as a contractor. Uh, for the most part of, of my day job, I do Linux kernel and U-boot bootloader work. Uh, I also do open embedded stuff. Uh, I'm sort of maintainer in these projects one way or the other. Uh, and I do FPGA stuff as uh, kind of hobby slash, it's kind of getting into my work as well, but it's mostly hobby stuff. Now, enough about me. Um, let's get to the talk. So this talk will have multiple parts. At the beginning, I would like to tell you what the SOC FPGA, uh, SOC FPGA combination is to like get everyone up to speed in case there is, uh, in case there are people who don't know what that is. Uh, then I'll just go through all the available solutions on the market, show you what they are capable of, uh, how you can operate them. And once we get through that, um, I'll show you with the bigger solutions uh, how to use them in Linux the right way um, because the vendor stuff kind of sucks. So uh, we will talk about that. And then we will conclude it and have a coffee and everything will be awesome. So um, first of all, what are all these abbreviations? Um, SOC, System on Chip. Um, that's quite simple. You just get a CPU core with some peripherals. Nothing new. It has some I.O. pads, so you can run your code on the CPU core. You can communicate with the outside world using the peripherals. It's just this piece of silicon. Um, prominent examples are the SOC, let's say, on a Beagle board, uh, Raspberry Pi, whatever. Um, FPGA, that's slightly different in that um, this is also a chip, which has a lot of IOs. But you, as a user of the FPGA, can actually program a uh, function of the chip into the chip. Um, I'll speak about how that's done in a bit. Uh, because it's super simple, the vendors tell you otherwise, but it's really super simple. Now, if you have this programmable chip where you can define what it's supposed to do and combine it with an SOC, you just get in SOG FPGA. And this is appearing recently again, these sort of chips. And you can get them for cheap, so I believe this is an interesting thing. Usually, the SOC and FPGA are connected through some sort of bus uh, on that chip. Um, in most cases, it's an AXI bus. So, uh, what's an FPGA, in fact? Uh, so, I said it's a sort of programmable chip where you can define the function, right? Uh, it's actually reasonably high speed, but not so much high speed. We are talking about like hundreds of megahertz kind of speed of the fabric of the FPGA. And it's really pretty much a programmable logical mesh where you can load the content of the mesh as a user. Um, it's mostly used nowadays for modeling hardware. So in case you need like something specific hardware-wise, you can put it into the FPGA. And sometimes ultimately you can manufacture ASIC sometime, somewhere down the line, but that's something you have to decide whether it makes sense or not. Uh, yeah, so the prominent use cases are modeling hardware. The other thing is uh, any sort of like pipeline processing. That means video. We just sample video, push it into the FPGA, apply some sort of filters, you know, stream the data through the FPGA, collect them on the other side, save them somewhere into memory or filter them out or whatever. Uh, same thing is with the video. You can use the FPGAs for streaming crypto, that works as well. And since you can do all these programmable stuff with it, they also use it for ASIC prototyping all the way to like, you know, modeling a processor there. Um, the caveat with that is that the fabric really runs at like hundreds of megahertz tops. And if you have some like complex design in there, well, due to the signal propagation delay, you have to run it at slower speeds. So if you put some complex ASIC there, you get to like tens of megahertz on these FPGAs. Now, the common vendors are like Xilinx, Altera, MicroSemi, Latis, these sorts of companies. There are others. I'll talk about that in a bit. Now, let's take a look at the, really at the inside of the FPGA because this is what the vendors tell you. Like it's super complex and you cannot understand that. So. Uh, on the left side here is a simple diagram of an FPGA. It's very simplified. Now, um, what you see here on the on the outside, this these black boxes, these are actually the pins on the chip. So you have to use some imagination there. Um, so these 
pins are actually connected to like voltage adaptation and I/O units, uh, and through these units they are connected into this blue uh, all-encompassing blob. Uh, this blue stuff is the global interconnect and connects together all the pieces in the FPGA, the I/O blocks here, and uh, logic array blocks on the inside, where you actually define the the logic functions now. Um, the global interconnect behaves as a, like a massive patch board, which you can program, and it's pretty much the most important part of the FPGA, because the logic array blocks on the inside, this is kind of boring. Um, the better global interconnect you have, the more logic array blocks you can actually pack into the FPGA. And if you retain the routability, then um, you basically have won, because you can increase the density of the logic elements there. Uh, now, if you look into the logic array block in, in some more detail, this is here. It's actually composed of logic elements which are connected through a local interconnect together. Now, the local interconnect is there to reduce uh, signal propagation delay in case you are implementing stuff like um, shift registers or arithmetic functions in the FPGA. And if you zoom in even further at the logic element, you will basically see this, so a lookup table and the register, which is optional. Now, this basic building block of the FPGA allows you to implement combinatorial and sequential logic. And basically, by connecting these basic building blocks together the way you need it, you can build any sort of hardware in the FPGA, starting from small stuff like blinking an LED all the way to a CPU. Now, um, this is pretty much it for explaining what an FPGA is. Do you have any questions about this one? Was it understandable? I hope so. Cool. That's great. So why would you want to do a SOG FPGA? I just said that you can model a CPU in the FPGA, right? So, um, well, if you look at it this way, uh, the reason for that is uh, if you put a CPU into the FPGA, it will waste a lot of resources, and the resources in the FPGA are not exactly super cheap. I mean, it is, it is affordable, but it's not super cheap such that you can just waste them. Uh, plus, uh, it will reduce the performance of the CPU, that sort of thing, uh, because the fabric will just run at like hundreds, maybe tens of megahertz. That's just not worth it. And if you look at it from the other side, why would you connect the FPGA to a CPU if you can have like a CPU with multiple peripherals and it's just available? Well, the reason for that is that you might really need some sort of obscure hardware connectivity. You might need like 20 UARTs and no one makes a CPU with 20 UARTs. Um, sure, you can ask the vendor, okay, manufacture me CPU with 20 UARTs, but it will be bloody expensive. So it's financially not sensible to do that. In that case, you just put in the SOG FPGA, synthesize 20 UART blocks in the FPGA, connect them to your CPU, and just you are done. You have your solution. So that's why the SOG FPGA is interesting. Now, uh, what is available? Well, there's quite a lot of things available in the SOG FPGA land, uh, SOG FPGA land actually. Um, the smallest one from Cypress and MicroSemi, which are Cortex-M, um, and then uh, the ones that run Linux from Altera and Xilinx, which are Cortex-A. Now, I'll go through all of them and show you what they are all about. Uh, first of all, uh, the Cypress uh, option, that's actually not a SOG FPGA per se. Uh, there is a bit of a history behind this one, actually. Uh, so this started when vendors were actually manufacturing like smoke detectors, kind of. And the idea was that when you manufacture a smoke detector, you have this analog part in there where you have to sample how it behaves, and like a lot of these analog parts just behave differently. Uh, so Cypress came up with this idea that they put a CPU in there and an analog part which is programmable, so you can kind of configure it the way you need without having too many external parts. And so they came up with 8051 CPU uh, with, well, programmable analog mesh. Now, this was a nice solution, so they extended that. Uh, first of all, they replaced the 8051 with Cortex-M0, then M3, then the latest one has uh, M0 plus M4. Uh, it has Bluetooth low energy. Um, they grew optional digital blocks, so now you have a couple of really like logic 
elements which you can chain together and implement digital functions, which might be interesting recently. Um, but the downside is it doesn't have any DDR RAM. You cannot really run Linux on that. You have to run some sort of RTOS. Um, also, if you look at the design suit, it's only for Windows, unfortunately. But there is an open source project in the works called the PSOC tools. Now, these people are trying to analyze the digital part of the PSOC. Because the way uh, the digital mesh is programmed is just by writing like a, this block of registers into some address in the, so in the SOX address space. And if you do that, the digital part is programmed and then you can do whatever you want there. Um, so that's what these people are trying to figure out. Um, now, if you stick with the Windows tool, well, OK, you can do your design. It's actually a schematic entry. It's uh, not uh, HDL. So that's another difference from the conventional FPGA tools. Uh, but the upside is that you have to only do the design once. You do it in the Windows tool, then you can pull out um, the configuration block and just put it into, let's say, your RTOS or something. And in the init function, you just program the digital block and then s jump into your RTOS's main function and do your thing. Uh, they have, yeah, this is how the Windows tool actually looks like. This is the schematic entry, is some sort of thermometer here. So basically, you really just connect blocks together. Now, for this PSOC, they actually have uh, BSPs for the standard open source RTOS's, FreeRTOS, and a couple more. UCOS2 is also available. So that, that's the first one. But this was kind of just sort of a curiosity. Uh, let's move on to uh, more complete solutions, which is Cortex-M3 based. Now, this looks a little bit more like a standard SOG FPGA system because it has a DDR, DRAM, although it is still Cortex-M. So you, if you run Linux, you have to run UC Linux. And this is actually possible although you will wind up running some sort of ancient vendor kernel, vendor UC Linux, and actually also vendor U-boot from like 2010, this one. Now the kit is actually available, it's super cheap, at like 125 from some random, um, random reseller, uh, so you can get it. Um, but the downside is the design tool, so if you ever decide to go with this uh, micro semi um, SOG FPGA, you will wind up uh, dealing with Libero, which is a um, disaster. So if we obtain it from micro semi, you have to go through this entire list of steps to get it installed correctly. It's not, not easy. Uh, once you get through that, you will have to start hunting on the internet for all these variables, which are I conveniently composed into the slides, so you don't have to do it. You don't have to suffer through this. Uh, because these things are just not documented with the design tool. You have to go through forums and just extract this information out from the forums and kind of guesswork it. And once you have this, then you can actually program the demo image from the vendor BSP into the kit and it actually doesn't work. So I wanted to show you how we can run the UC Linux on that. Unfortunately, it's just broken beyond imagination. Now, it would be really amazing if someone picked this one up and started working on the upstream U-boot for the Micro Semi Smart Fusion 2 and upstream Linux support. That would be amazing. Now, uh, moving from the uh, land of the Cortex-M and the, all the smaller ones to uh, the land of uh, application processors, so Cortex-A from Altera, so FPGA. Uh, this is actually SOC as you know it. So Cortex-A9 with the standard peripherals, you know, that's like SPI bus, I2C, CAN bus, and so on. Uh, it has a DDR controller on it, uh, and it, it is actually meant to run Linux, this one. Uh, plus, there is an upcoming Stratix 10 from, our, uh, from Altera, which will be ARM64, Cortex-A53. Um, there is a kind of quirk on, on this one that you can run it in AMP configuration. So if you need some sort of like whatever real-time task, you can run Linux on one core and RTOS on the other core of the uh, ARM uh, Cortex-A9 core complex. 
And if you decide to actually use the, the Alterosog FPGA in your project, you will first thing you will run into is the design software from Intel Altera. It used to be called Quartus, now it's called Intel FPGA. Um, the tool actually works. While it's proprietary, it actually works on Linux, and it's not difficult to set up. You just download this 15 gigabyte blob of stuff, just run it on your system. Uh, <coughs> well, it, okay, it, it works better than the previous ones I mentioned, okay? That's sort of better. Uh, so you just download that, you run it on your system, it actually installs itself and it actually launches itself and doesn't crash immediately. Which for a proprietary software is amazing. <laughs> now, there is something called Project Typhoon which I'm running, uh, which looks into the Cyclone 4 FPGAs to figure out how they work on the inside to implement um, open source bitstream generator. So in case you are interested in that sort of thing, uh, please let me know. Uh, moving away from uh, this proprietary stuff, uh, the next thing you will want to look into is bootloader for a SOG FPGA. Um, there are multiple options, actually. Uh, one of them is the Altera provided vendor U-boot, which is stuck in the Stone Age, and it doesn't make sense. It's buggy and ancient, and it's just all sorts of useless. Uh, then there is Mainline, which is Amazing, obviously, it's actively developed, and all the features which are in the vendor you would are actually in mainline. So, if you decide to use Altera, just use mainline U boot. Um, there is a small detail that uh, Aria 10 is currently being submitted upstream, and Stratix 10 is also being submitted upstream. So, Intel is actually working on getting their stuff in there, which is good. Now, uh, if you are somehow hostile toward GPL, um, Altera was providing something called the MPL, which was kind of their BSD licensed bootloader now. I cannot recommend that to anyone because this was just something which initialized the hardware and started some sort of binary from some address. Problem is, no one really maintains that MPL, and all the bugs which were fixed actually in the vendor U boot and in mainline are, are just still there. So. If you come across that, avoid that at all cost. Okay, uh, next thing, you, uh, Linux. So for SOG FPGA, again, you have two options, mainline Linux or vendor Linux. Now, Altera is really trying to keep up with mainline, so they have this like a vendor Linux branch, but it's in reasonably good shape. Uh, on the other hand, on the generation five uh, SOG FPGA, so it's Cyclone 5, Aria 5, you can use mainline and all the blocks on the SOC side are actually supported in mainline. So the drivers are, are all there, the device tree is there. The only thing which is missing is actually, uh, yeah, this needs updating. The only thing that's actually missing from mainline is the config of us device tree overlay loader. All right. Um, the thing is, all the stuff to load the FPG, the content into the FPGA is in mainline. Also, the support for device tree overlays is in mainline, but there is no interface from user space to actually load the device tree overlay into the kernel. So that's missing. Uh, but you can pick a patch from um, LKML. It's been posted multiple times. It's now in version 7, this config of S loader. And apply it to your kernel, and then you get the DTO loader, and you can operate even the FPGA part in mainline. And then you just have to, you don't have to care about the vendor kernel at all. So that's that. Um, basically, the only competitor to that solution from Altera is Xilinx, and super similar to that one. Again, they have two offerings, Cortex-A9 based Zinc and A53 based Zinc MP. Um, the SOC part is, again, quite similar. You know, CPU core with standard SPI, I2C, CAN bus. Uh, yeah, they have DDR memory again. The Zinc MP has DDR4. Actually, um, what else do they have there? Oh yeah, um, they had this brilliant idea with Zing MP to actually add a GPU there to make this SOG FPGA kind of like a multimedia ready. Now, the brilliant idea didn't really work out because they put in an ARM Mali 400 and that implies blobs, um, which are quite a disaster because they have no GBM support 
and you actually need to patch the kernel with some sort of weird patch to allow you to like pan frame buffer because they don't do double buffering the standard upstream way. They just do double buffering their own Mali way. Oh, and did I mention that the GPU is actually from 2008 in this SOC, which was released in 2016? Oh, well. Yeah, but just to kind of lighten up the, the mood, um, there is new development in the Lima driver. Uh, there's some Chinese guy who actually is, is working on a Mesa uh, NIR compiler, which is a, able to compile shaders for the Mali Utgard, which is like the Mali 400, 430, and 450. And at this point, it's possible to actually bind the kernel part from the Lima driver on the Zing MP, use this new patched Mesa with the NIR uh, shader compiler, and do off-screen rendering. So you can kind of get some life out of the GPU with an open source driver, which is amazing. So if you're interested in that Lima driver, that's, that's what you want. Uh, but I'll just talk about Ubud and Linux now. Yeah, you can run RTOSs on that, but it's not really meant for it. So if you decide to go with the Zinc, you will run into the Xilinx software, which is called uh, Vivado. It is very similar to Quartus. Again, you download massive blob of stuff, you run it on your system. Um, actually, it is again proprietary, and it kind of reasonably well runs for a proprietary software. So you install it, start it, and you can operate uh, the, the SOC. Now, uh, there is an open source solution in the works uh, for Zinc 7000, I believe, from the same guy who did uh, the project Ice Storm. So in case you are interested in that, in Ice Storm, take a look at this. Um, yeah, so let's move on to the bootloader stuff. Uh, on Zinc, it is a little bit more complicated. Now, with the standard Zinc 7000, the older one, most of the stuff is in upstream U-boot, so just forget vendor U-boot, use upstream, and it's everything works, it's done. Uh, with Zing MP, this is quite a new chip, so all the stuff is coming into upstream, and Xilinx is actually taking care of that to get it in there. Uh, but not everything which you might require is still supported in upstream. Uh, what I would suggest to you is to evaluate whether all you need is in there, and if so, just use mainline. If not, uh, you might have to fall back to this... Uh, FSBL solution from Xilinx. Now this FSBL is uh, Xilinx's preloader, which actually configures the power management unit, um, the FPGA on the Zing MP, and then starts U-boot. Uh, it's actually quite tied to the Defender U-boot, so, uh, which is kind of full of weird patches, so I would be a little careful about this one. Um, right, yeah, what's that? Oh yeah, what is ATF was the question. So ATF is an ARM trusted firmware. Uh, that is required for ARM V8, yes. Uh, yeah, about the Linux kernel support. So um, on Zinc 7000, again, the SOC peripherals are mostly supported in mainline. So if you use the Zinc 7000, you shouldn't have much of a problem. Uh, again, the FPGA manager stuff, the support for loading the FPGA is in there. The config FS interface is missing because this is like, for the DTOs is missing. That's not there. Um, what Xilinx does with their vendor kernel is that they are tracking the LTSI releases of the Linux kernel. So right now Xilinx released uh, 4.9. They will be re releasing a new updated uh, vendor kernel 4.14 in January or something like that. So that's basically the plan. Um, unfortunately, in the vendor kernel, there are some patches which are questionable. Some of them were actually explicitly re uh, rejected on the mailing list because they are like a real disaster and problematic, but in the vendor kernel, they just are there. So be careful. And uh, I would suggest you that you like take a good look at what you are running on your system. Yeah, in mainline, the Zing MP is coming. And uh, in case you are missing something, it might be better to just backport it from the vendor kernel into your tree and then just run mainline. Now, um, that's basically the introduction of all these uh, SOG FPGAs. 
and the final section will be about how to get them running all the way from bootloader to Linux. Uh, do you have any questions at this point? No questions? Okay, so let's get to the software part. Uh, so first of all, if you decide to go with Altera, getting the bootloader running is actually quite simple with mainline. Uh, first of all, in Quartus you compile the FPGA project. This will allow you to run BSP editor, which you run. It will generate the BSP, which contains a couple of files and patches for the U-boot. Now, for the most part, you ignore that. You just take a script called uh, QTS filter from uh, mainline U-boot. You point it to the BSP directory, tell it which FPGA, uh, which sort of FPGA you have. It will pull out the necessary files, turn them into some sort of more uh, civilized form, and then you put these files into U-boot, into like board slash vendor slash board name slash QTS. You add the SOG FPGA C, which you copy from any other board because it's just like a boilerplate file. Uh, you add a make file, you add a board config, which again you can pull from another board. Uh, just do a make uh, something something, name of the board, uh, dev config, make. This produces the U boot with SPL uh, SFP file. You either install it to your SD card or to an SPI flash. Depends on how your system is set up. And then you just flick the system up and it boots U boot. Yeah, it's, it's really that simple to get U-Boot running on the SOG FPGA, it's, it's no rocket science. Now with Sync, it's quite similar actually. You again use the design software, the Vivado, compile the FPGA project, you get a file which has an extension of H HDF. Uh, this is actually a hidden zip file, so you just unzip it, you get out of it a PS, either PS7 or PSU, depending on which chip you have. Uh, in it, .c and .h. Uh, again, you put it into board slash vendor slash uh, name of the board uh, directory. You have to add, again, some sort of boilerplate board file, make file, def config file, and again, run like make something something board name def config. Uh, make that produces a boot bin file that again you put either on your SD card, SPI flash, NAND flash, depending on how your board is set up, power the board up and it comes up. Congratulations, you got uh, Xilinx Zinc operational. Um, ultimately, when you reach the U-boot shell, you can load FPGA using the FPGA command, although um, this is not recommended, it's preferred to do it from Linux because then you have better control over the FPGA itself. So, how does it work when you want to load Bitstream into the FPGA? So, vendors had this brilliant idea that they will create a device node and you just get the Bitstream in there and then they will give you like a SysFS interface which you can poke and turn on the bridges between the SOC and the FPGA. And uh, after that you somehow access the hardware with DevMem or something or maybe bind drivers to it. Now what happens if someone has the brilliant idea that after you reprogram the FPGA and turn on the bridges and bind some hardware to it, that he will reload the bitstream again? Well then your drivers are accessing something which is in a state of undefined. So your entire system gets into undefined state, maybe you will get a bus hang, maybe it will crash in some weird way, so this, is, this just doesn't work. Uh, so how the Linux kernel de deals with this sort of situation is actually with two things. Uh, the first thing is how the Linux deals with variable hardware, and the other thing is how it deals with the FPGA. Now, the way it deals with variable hardware is using device tree overlays. Um, how this works is that your Linux system with a device tree is actually converted into a Linux system with a live device tree which can be patched at runtime. And this is what the device tree overlays are about. Basically, you describe uh, the piece of hardware which is added into the system as a device tree overlay. You load it at runtime into the kernel. The live device tree in the kernel is patched with the pieces from the device tree uh, overlay or device tree fragment. The kernel knows that something changed and eventually binds drivers to this new node which you added into the device tree or something like that. Um, there is a small detail 
with the DTOs is that if you patch a node in the DTO, which was already enabled in the live tree, uh, you can get a notification within the driver, but uh, the driver will not be reloaded. So this is like a small quirk there. Uh, so how does it work when you load the device tree overlay? Uh, this is with the config as loader, which is not in mainline kernel. You have to pick it from um, the kernel mailing list. Uh, so basically how it works is you create this directory. You, this my DTO is anything arbitrary you can choose. Uh, you have a device tree overlay, an input one. So you just create the directory, use device tree compiler with this special option which generates a symbol table. You just compile the device tree overlay into DTB and cat it into this directory slash DTBO. That triggers the device tree overlay loader, patches the, the device tree in the kernel, and then the kernel handles the changes. So you do your stuff, and if you want to unload the device tree overlay, you just delete uh, this directory again. The device tree is unpatched, actually. It's that simple. Now, the device tree overlays don't only work for FPGA, so it can be used for anything like um, all the capes which you have for your, what's that, beagle board. It can be used for like Raspberry Pi extension boards. All that sort of stuff can be described by the device tree overlays, and then you can use the DTOs to operate that hardware. Now, this is how the device tree overlay source looks like. It's nothing special, really. Uh, the only difference from a device tree is this plugin clause, which uh, marks that as a device tree overlay. And then within the device tree overlay, you have fragments which say uh, which target path should be patched in the live device tree and with what. So in this case, I'm patching a SOC Ethernet node. I'm saying, OK, I want the Ethernet to be RGMII, and I'm enabling it. So that is OK. Um, another thing I do here, you can have multiple fragments, obviously. I'm patching some sort of I square C switch and adding this sort of I square C E EEPROM, which is compatible with the AT24 C01. Now, that's the first part. The other part is FPGA Manager. So, FPGA Manager is uh, used for handling this block on the SOC side, which allows you to load bitstream into the FPGA part and handles the enabling and disabling of the bridges between the SOC and the FPGA. Um, this is supported in mainline. Currently, uh, we support uh, Altera FPGAs, uh, Zing 7000, Zing MP is coming. We support loading the latest IC40 FPGA connected over SPI. So if you are using the iStorm project uh, bitstream generator, you can also use that. Um, we also support partial reconfiguration, which is amazing, although kind of dangerous, in my opinion. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much what the FPGA manager is all about. Uh, so how does that work? Well, you have a special node in your device tree which says, OK, this is my FPGA control node. Uh, so you write the device tree overlay, you patch that node and say, in that device tree overlay, what sort of bitstream should be loaded into the FPGA, into which area in case you use partial reconfiguration, uh, and then you define what devices are under which bridge. And when you load that overlay, the following happens, basically. First of all, the device tree, uh, sorry, the um, FPGA manager is triggered. The bitstream is loaded into the FPGA. Then the bridges are enabled based on what's in the DTO. And then ultimately, uh, the drivers are bound to the, dri to the devices beyond the bridges. Um, this way, there is no way for a user to actually interfere with the process, because it's all sandbox in, in the device tree overlay, and the user cannot really mess it up. Uh, the one quirk here is that when you unload the device tree overlay, the kernel actually unbinds the drivers first, then disables the bridges, but leaves the FPGA running. Uh, this is because there can be some critical bits in the FPGA, which may cause some trouble in case you actually shut off the FPGA after unloading the DTO, and it may not be described in the device tree. So that's the rationale why we leave the FPGA running. And here's an example of device tree overlay for the FPGA manager. So as you can see, it's the standard DTO. I have a fragment. I'm patching uh, the control bridge in the FPGA manager node. Uh, I have only one area here. 
because I'm using the entire FPGA. Um, here I specify the bitstream, and here I specify that I want to add one single UART because that's what I have in the FPGA on the control bridge. Now, when I load this device tree overlay, I'll actually get a dev TTI S something in my system. It's that simple. And that's all I have, actually. Um, the FPGA manager and the device tree overlays are really amazing. So if you use SOC FPGA solutions, you <coughs> use mainline and use the FPGA manager and DTOs, it really makes your life so much easier. So thank you for your attention. And do you have any questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there are two. So the first, probably quite naive question. So what is that bridge uh, something, bridge manager or whatever? Bridge manager? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the handling of the bridges between the SOC and the FPGA is actually handled by the FPGA manager framework. Yeah, what are those bridges in itself? Right, so um, the thing is you can synthesize some sort of devices in the FPGA and to allow your CPU to access those devices in the FPGA, you somehow need to create some sort of buses in the FPGA. Now, the bridges uh, in the FPGA manager allow you to connect the CPU buses to the buses in the FPGA. So basically, that's uh, sort of a driver uh, which uh, implements that connection between your CPU and FPGA uh, through some standard means, right? Yeah. Okay. So there is like some sort of uh, um, bus termination on the FPGA side, which you can connect to the CPU side or not. And if the FPGA is not programmed, well, the bus would lead nowhere, so you need to disable those bridges so that you don't actually hang the CPU bus. And those bridges are written by yourself, or these are standards, so things that are... Yeah, the bridges are actually uh, dependent on the SOC FPGA, which you use. OK, thank you. Yep. OK, so thank you. It's there was another one in the back. One more. So one problem with FPGA's development is that it's quite slow to generate the bitstream. So yeah. how slow is it really? And is there a difference between the open source tool chains and the closed source tool chains? Uh, that's a really nice question. So yeah, generating the bitstream for an FPGA is actually, I believe, NP complete problem. So you have to search the entire problem space to like pack it into the FPGA in the most efficient way. Obviously, there are heuristics, but the bigger FPGA you have, the slower the process is. Um, there is this sort of story going around that the FPGA vendors are actually optimizing for an eight-hour cycle with the biggest FPGAs. And the reason for that is that when the FPGA engineer kind of comes into work, he um, does some sort of changes on the FPGA, then hits the compile, and at the end of his shift, he actually can check whether it compiled or not, or whether he likes it or not, do some changes, and then let it compile overnight, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the sort of story there. Now, in my experience, yes, it takes quite a lot of time to compile this stuff, uh, even on a performance machine, depending on the size of the FPGA. Also, uh, the vendor tools are all sorts of quirky. They kind of mm -hmm. sometimes crash, so you have to recompile from scratch, and it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, the open source tool chain is actually available for very small FPGA. So I cannot say comparatively to a big FPGA whether it's so much better or so much faster, uh, but it is so much easier to use. Really, to get started with the ice storm, um, this is just, you buy the kit, you do apt-get install ice storm tools, then download an example, just type make, and you have started your first FPGA project. It's really that simple. Now, with the vendor tools, you download a bazillion of gigabytes of stuff, agree to all sorts of weird licenses, then you install it, it takes a long time, then you get this massive GUI with all sorts of buttons, and you have no idea what to do at the beginning. So. Yeah, getting started with the open source tool is so much easier. Mm -hmm. But then again, um, the vendor tools have a lot of capabilities which are not in the open source tool chain yet. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Mom. Uh, you mentioned that there is a 
first solution for resign zinc uh, work in progress yes yeah what is it um, can you elaborate a little bit what's that what is it, uh, what is it what's the project it's work in progress I believe it will be announced in like a month in public uh, if you look at the ice storm page and look for zinc 7000 you can find some details there so it's exactly the same guy looking into the Zinc 7000 that's looking that that did the project ice storm uh, do you know something that he does not <laughs> announce it publicly or what? Uh, I'm not sure if it's publicly announced. Yeah, okay. But there are, there are some informations around that project. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, yep. One more. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, could you elaborate on uh, device tree overlays usage for the usual kernel drivers? You said that uh, the driver mm. is loaded with mm -hmm. the original uh, device tree, and then this overlay comes, and what happens? Um, you mean in the, uh, oops, what's going on? There we go. In the usual case, when you load like device tree overlay like this? Yes. yes. Yeah, so basically the kernel is actually internally notified that something changed in the device, <coughs> in the its, its own live device tree, that there are some new nodes, and it has to check what changed. If you only change uh, node itself, uh, you would have to have uh, a hook in the driver itself to intercept these changes, because uh, the driver is already active. But if you activate the driver, the kernel actually binds the driver with these configurations to that node. So you can, if it, uh, this driver is comes as a loadable module, you can uh, oh. reload it? and have the updated device tree, right? Yeah, if it comes as a loadable module, actually what you can do is you can just uh, either load an overlay which sets the status to disabled and then unload that overlay, which would basically trigger a reload of that particular node. And every driver which use this DTO uh, re registers some callbacks for uh, some events? Not all of them. Yeah, the drivers don't do it. Uh, you would have to explicitly have such a notifier in, in the driver if you want to intercept changes to the nodes. Uh, usually, you just turn the, uh, to turn the node on by setting OK, and then the driver is bound to a node populated with the correct values already at that point. And your callback in the driver parses the changes which arrived, right? Well, the kernel driver model does that, right? It then binds basically a driver to a fully populated device node when you flick it to OK. Thanks. Yep. OK. Uh, any more questions and comments? Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, as I remember, there was a screenshot of some software, and there was a sham. Uh, so all of the software use uh, some graphical language to describe uh, uh, functional blocks, or there is some very local or which DL. Yeah, that's stuff. a good question. Uh, so this was really an example of the Cypress PSO Creator, which is like a Windows tool, and it's the only one that uses uh, schematic entry for the FP for the programmable logic configuration, because at this scale it's still manageable. All the other devices which I described after that just use the standard HDLs, that means Verilog VHDL or whatever compiles into those languages. So uh, with this, uh, um, yeah, with this Libero, you just get a standard GUI where you just put your uh, HDL code. And you can run all these tools and their uh, HDL compilers from command line as well. So if you are not a big fan of the GUIs, you can just call the tools directly from command line with all three of these, Libero, Quartus, Vivado, all of them support that. And they support uh, TCL scripting as well. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, more questions and comments? OK, so it is a question to you. Which one was the best? I believe the gentleman in the back. Okay. Well, uh, that one was really nice. Give him a shot. No option, just uh, size uh, M. So no one left. <laughs> okay. And shall, shall I suppose? Thank you.
again, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for the last of the list. Thank you.